Hi, I'm Ben Furman. And I'm Nate Blayton. This is Patch In, the show from SoundNotion.tv dedicated to the wonderful world of electroacoustic music. And to start off with news, we're going to do a little follow-up on Little Bits collaboration with Korg that we talked about last episode. Um, just to <laughs> get everybody caught up, uh, Little Bits is a... They were doing this big open source project doing a sit, synth kit on GitHub. And uh, there's a, an interesting article from createdigitalmusic.com by Peter Kern uh, talking about just kind of giving an update about that, but they've uh, an interesting development is that they've re, uh, released uh, PDFs of schematics <laughs> of uh, things like Korg's old filter circuits and things like that. And um, so the the products that we talked about last week or last month you can still get, but now there's a little bit more that you can check out, and there's uh, some <laughs> some nice videos and everything. We'll uh, we'll link to it all in the notes. Okay, next up, Yamaha's MOFX series of synthesizers is now shipping. Uh, this is a follow-up to the MOX, only it has double the polyphony, more memory, more programs, and more options for you to tweak with. So if you're a Yamaha person, uh, you'll know that this is based off of the Motif line, just in a much more affordable and much, much, much lighter package. Mm -hmm. And... Uh Along the lines of uh, keyboards and controllers, we've talked a little bit about different kinds of uh, physical interfaces for synthesizers on this show. And uh, there's a, a nice, like, really exciting new thing from Roly. I believe that's how it's pronounced, but it's R-O-L-I, the company out of London that's been around since 2009. They've got this thing called the Seaboard. And I don't know if you've seen any of the videos of this floating around on the Internet, but it's a really cool interface. Um, <laughs> it looks like you are got your hands in a sponge that's roughly like like it's a keyboard that's been underwater for too long and it's got all this fuzzy stuff on top. But what it does is it gives you an interface for controlling a synthesizer that has <laughs> like velocity, aftertouch, but then also different kinds of like shaping things just pressing through this interface. So if you've ever uh, gotten to play with a ribbon controller, this is like a piano with ribbon controllers on every key in, in a couple different directions and then also some other stuff. It's really impressive and they've got uh, Seaboard, Seaboard Grand Studio, Grand Stage and a, a couple other versions. And yeah, uh, quite expensive interfaces but get some really interesting music for your money. Yeah, there's, Dave's got a picture of it up. It's, uh, yeah, looks quite intriguing to me. <laughs> yeah, and hey, if they wanted to send us a review copy, I would be happy to play around with it. Precisely. As long as I don't have to give it back. Right, exactly. <laughs> okay, uh, the other major piece of uh, news for those of you who are Android users, uh, you might be familiar with Caustic, which is basically the Android equivalent of Reason. Uh, well, it's been updated. We now have version 3, which I have on my phone, of course. Uh, <laughs> it adds a bunch of new synths, a bunch of new devices, and the biggest thing that's different is that uh, if you're running Android 4.3 or above, it has better latency. It's still Android, so you're going to have to deal with a lot of latency, but it's nowhere near as bad as it previously was. Mm -hmm. Also, and this is kind of cool, uh, if you're an iPhone user or an iPad user, it's now available on iOS as well. So you can go and get that through the Android uh, Google Play Store or on iOS through uh, the Apple Store. Yeah, so that's uh, that's it for the news for this week, and uh, <laughs> yep. which brings us to introducing our amazing guest, Sam Pluta. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. <laughs> so it's been it's been an intriguing thing reading uh, about all your work and getting to hear and some see some videos of different things that you've been doing. But yeah. so you're you're from New York. You're a laptop improviser, electronics performer, and sound artist. And I've uh, seen work of yours with the uh, International Contemporary Ensemble, as well as the Wet Ink Ensemble, I, be I believe. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks so much for coming on our show. Thanks. Thanks. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. Um, so this show is all about uh, different kinds of electronics and, and music and everything. And it's a, <laughs> we haven't really gotten into laptop performance. And calling yourself a laptop performer is, is, is a little bit different. And uh, I was wondering if you could just talk about that a little bit. Um, well, you know, I, I, um, 
I went to music school and I was uh, I pl- practiced piano and I yeah. studied piano. I studied piano for you know seven eight years, and uh, you know I'm pretty terrible still at the piano. <laughs> um, and during that time, I also got really into um, electronic music and making electronic music. And at some point, I decided, hey, um, if I'm going to get good at one of these things, it's going to be the laptop. So I decided to focus on that as my instrument. Um, and well, what it means is I just that's my that's my instrument and there's and the wonder thing wonderful thing about the laptop is that it is uh it's very versatile it's it can do so many different things um you can do solo stuff you can do ensemble music um you can do impro- improvised music and uh video and i've tried to dabble in each of those and become really good at some of them interesting so yeah i I've also seen you holding uh, an interesting looking little device on your on your website. It's yes. uh yeah. it's, looks like a picture frame with a bunch of hexagons in it. <laughs> yeah, that's, um, that's the Snyder Phonics Monta. Um it's made by Jeff Snyder who runs Snyder Phonics. Mm-hmm. And um he was a colleague of mine at Columbia University where we both were doing our doctorates. Um and he designed this beautiful interface which I use. Um and I I highly recommend uh, checking it out. It's it's awesome. The uh, a lot of great features about it. For instance, uh, if you look at it, um, you know the keyboard is just left to right. Mm-hmm. The nice thing about the Monta is it's left to right and up and down with the buttons. And uh, for audio, that actually makes a lot of sense because what it allows mm-hmm. me to do is think about how my software is set up as um, maybe controls for for yeah there it is uh, <laughs> maybe controls for um, uh, for a single synthesize synth or processing module from left to right and then and then audio going from top to bottom so i can think about the flow of audio as well as the controls of uh of certain modules that i'm using to manipulate sound interesting and like, i'm just how, looking yeah, just ahead. looking at the layout on that it reminds me a lot of a tone net from a neo romanian uh, <laughs> <laughs> wait uh, say that again Oh, it reminds me of uh, one of the tone nets in uh, Neo-Romanian theory, the way that it's laid out so that uh, you can transform both uh, up and down as well as left and right or at a diagonal in order to get uh, similar events. Harmonic shifts. Yeah, yeah harmonic shifts. Well, you know, I mean, the, when, you know, the way Jeff thought about it, and, and if you look at his, his work, and I definitely I recommend having him on the show because he's, he's a great instrument designer, and since that seems like something you guys are interested in, yeah. um, the way he thought about it was, it was actually thinking about tuning and um, thinking about, because um, he's a just intonation, he uses that all, a lot, so okay. um, that's, that's, that's what he was thinking about. When I'm, when I'm thinking, I'm just thinking about uh, sound, not tuning, so I, I use it in a different way than he had imagined. But I, I think that's probably true with most of most controllers and most audio software that people make is that people end up using it in different ways than what they were designed for. Yeah, and that's I, especially the flexibility of a laptop and and different kind of interface where you you might be able to use any kind of software and connect it with that interface. Yeah, that'd be an interesting thing. Yeah, um, totally. I mean, you know, it's it's running um, that's sending um, OSC data and. OSC okay. data can do can do anything that you want it to do. So once once you have that data, then map it onto your sounds, and there it is. Yeah, I remember uh, <laughs> when my early investigation into building interfaces. I think I had a a Make controller kit inside of a big <laughs> case of wood, and it was using Open Sound Control to communicate between the Make controller kit, the microcontroller, and, and make the sounds <laughs> and everything. Yeah, that's a that's a fun thing. That just that language as an interface, and it's cool to see it used in all these different ways. Um, so, and I'm personally really a huge fan of OSC. Uh, just whether it's the Touch OSC or through an Arduino board or pretty much anything you can get your hands on that has it. Um, just the level of control that you're afforded with it is so much greater than regular MIDI. Yeah, <laughs> totally. I mean, my other controller. My other controller is an iPad running Lemur, which is fantastic nice. software. And um, and yeah, I mean, you basically you're sending the you're sending the information that you want to send. You don't have to then decode that information into um, into other things. Another nice thing about about OSC is that you know if I have a slider, um, it's labeled slider 15, and it and it and it sends the the information. Well, 
um, in in when you when you save a patch and load it back up, it's much easier to have that mapping map directly than it was with MIDI. Also, mm-hmm. there's, yeah. there's just more you know more options. <laughs> cool. So um, I, as we started the show, we I kind of skipped over a couple other things that you do. So you're uh, you're also, I mean, so you've been playing with all of these different ensembles, the Peter Evans Quintet Rock and the Rocket Science Free Improv Group, as well yeah. as an educator, ed, educator <laughs> working at uh, all these different places. Um, yeah, and it's, uh, it's it really, it's, it's cool. <laughs> Thank you so much for having or coming on our show. Oh, yeah, you um, bet. Could you talk a little bit about um, what it's like playing in the different groups that you, like, Free improvisation, as a po- or compared to really, like, specifically composed things, right. is playing in a chamber group. I yeah, think. so I'm I'm the technical director for Wet Ink Ensemble, so mm-hmm. um, that's a group that I play in quite regularly. In fact, we just had five days of rehearsals. So oh, yeah, <laughs> in, in that setting, I mean, in that setting, in the in the um, composed music setting, I feel like the laptop is uh, good at triggering samples. Maybe doing some simple processing, um, at, or or acting as an improviser. Um, and so, a lot of the times when I'm working with um, a composed or an ensemble that has no notes on a page, um, yeah. I will improvise on top of it because I feel like the the laptop's so good at finding finding these little sounds, these little nuances to what's going on in a, in a, a, a sonic space, but it's not great at um at repeating something exactly you know and and (laughs) classical musicians basically spend their their whole life figuring out how to create recreate things exactly and that's awesome it's just i don't think the computer is there yet so hopefully hopefully we'll get there and i i love i love making music in that setting um it's it's usually a lot more low-key for the laptop player just because of how you, you have to interact with the group um but a lot of times there's a lot of really interesting stuff so um um, yeah, then then in an improv setting, so in the Peter Evans Quintet, which is a is a partially composed, we're playing tunes, we're playing almost, it's somewhat like jazz, a lot of yes. it. And so there's, there's a head, and then there's improv, and then there's the head at the end sometimes. Mm-hmm. Not really. But, um, <laughs> but in that setting, you know, it's more like, okay, this is the spot where I'm improvising with Peter. This is the spot where I'm improvising with Ron, our pianist. This is the spot where I'm improvising with... Um, Tom, our, our bass player. So it's like working with uh, working with those guys um, and saying like, okay, that's what I'm I'm going to do. I'm going to improvise with the bass player now, and having all of us work around that, and then get back into the into the tune at some point if there is one, or into whatever the noted the noted material is because there's always some noted material um, in the free improv setting, and that's totally different. It's uh, the relationship between the players is such that we're leading each other in different ways. So sometimes I might have to be, I might have to be the leader in, in a, in a, um, in a sonic space. And, um, and sometimes I might have to be a follower. Sometimes you want to be up front. Sometimes you want to be in the back. So um, playing like the rocket science group, it's with uh, Peter Evans and Craig Taborn and Evan Parker, who are just the best. So in that group, um, all of us are kind of pushing each other, and trying to trying to push the the sound into new places um, through what we're doing with a laptop. That's hard. That's harder to be the yeah. leader actually, because I mean, if you've worked with um, electronics uh, processing in any way, you know that if you're processing the piano, well, there's always going to be a latency if, yeah. if you're processing yeah. right. And so you know, there's a little delay uh, between. Uh, when they play and when the sound hits the mic and then there's a delay when it's digitized and then there's a delay probably in your process because that's really all a computer can do is delay stuff. And so, and then there's a delay in the, uh, going back to analog. And so you're always behind the the player. Um, and what I've found is that what I've done with my software is created such that I can grab sounds and be able to work with those sounds, uh, a, apart from just, just, manipulating the piano live so I can manipulate what I've manipulated. So I've, I've been processing the piano for a while uh, and then I've recorded that and then I can go back and play along with my recording that I've just made processing them. Yeah. Um, and so finding ways and what that does is uh, the, 
the further you are away from their sound and whether that's with um, delay or with distortion, the further you are away, then all of a sudden you can create an identity that is not their sound. And so I feel like laptop improvisation is, is almost just playing with that all the time. It's playing with how close am I to the person that I'm manipulating and how far am I away from them? And then being able to move between close and far so that the audience always has this thing where they're like, oh, is he manipulating them? Is he not manipulating <laughs> them? What is he doing? That sounds like the piano. Wait, that doesn't sound like the piano at all. So that's, yeah. that's what that process is like. Building some really interesting sounds, yeah. <laughs> and so I uh, I understand you're a super collider user. Is that is that right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Nice. yeah so uh, um, and then yeah, that I haven't used that software myself, but I it's I understand it's a you type in code or like how much of a uh, do you ever come into an improvisation setting with uh, sounds pre made or do you grab everything from the group? Um, I don't have any sounds pre-made. I have um, microphones on people, so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm doing a live processing. Uh, and then I have synthesis stuff I can do. So I, oh, I can okay. do synthesis. But, and so I guess that would be maybe pre-made. But there's nothing that's like I'm not I, – I don't really use samples. I'm, I'm not against it. It's just I, um, I don't use that. I mean I, I know people who only use samples who are incredible. Um, yeah, like, yeah. Ikue Mori or Richard Barrett, just incredible players, and they, they use samples. So, um, yeah, and Super Collider, um, lots of people use it in many different ways. The way I use it is I've created a graphical user interface to manipulate. Okay. So I'm not typing code live. I'm, <laughs> okay. I'm, there are people that do that, and there are people that do that really well. Um, I'm, I make too many coding mistakes when I'm coding to be able to do that. You know, you, sure. you really need to be able to oh, just yeah. like type a perfect line of code, and some people can do that. Um, uh, for me, I'm basically manipulating sliders and uh, and buttons and faders and and um, you know X Y um, controllers. And uh, the one of the things that Monta does is I have a, a capacitance, so I can control each. I can control individual um, values with my tips of my fingers. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so, so that's how I have it set up. I basically made this GUI and I've set up a very large graphical user interface that can run up to a hundred different processing modules at the same time. So, uh, and then what the performing is, is moving smoothly or not smoothly between all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Now I actually am a super collider user as well. Great. So, um, I'm always curious when I see other people who are using it. Uh, what was your uh, intent in going with Super Collider as opposed to Max, which has a much more user-friendly uh, ability to design GUIs and interface with uh, objects on screen? Yeah, um, you know, I I have a degree. Well, I, I have a degree in computer science, basically. And you know, when I was 13 years old, I wasn't practicing the piano. I was sitting at my computer, like typing code. So that's what I was doing when I was, when I was a teenager. And, uh, so typing code is sec kind of second nature to me, whereas, um, boxes are not. And I, um, you know, in, in college and getting this computer science degree, I had to, um, I had to take electrical engineering classes and my design was great. You know, everything was cool except like the wire was just a little off, you know, and that's, and I, I found that so frustrating with hardware and, uh, and, and I think that translates to Max. Like, I just don't like the boxes and cables. I love coding. I also love the ability to program object-oriented uh, style. I love, I love to be able to code that way um, to make, you know, classes and, um, and use inheritance and, and all, all that stuff. Because yeah. it's, it's once you, once you, it takes a long time. That language is, is, is dense. Yes. Uh, and, it just takes a long time to 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 internalize it, but I I I think it's very learnable and it's and it's a it's a beautiful language. So I, I love using it. Mm -hmm. I I totally hear that with the like the different things you can do with boxes or with coding, especially with object oriented programming. I've been I've been getting into doing some visual uh, work for the first time these last couple of years, and I, I mostly do that in the Java based language processing, yeah. just because because. For for me, for some reason, that seems to work better and everything. Um, so, 
I we noticed that you you have some video work that you've been doing as well. Do you do that in Super Collider as well, or is that a different? I, I do. So um, the the video software itself, so the thing that's playing the video um, or playing the the um, the graphic is uh, is Quartz Composer, okay. um, which is yeah. it's basically free with um, with developer tools. And I don't know. I hope they're still um, using it. It's really wonderful and fast. Um, program um, and for a while you could embed and this isn't true with a new version of Super Collider which is kind of a bummer but there's there's a workaround for it but for a while you could embed Quartz Composer in Super Collider yeah, okay. um, and just send it messages um, so that's that's how I would, that's how I was doing that and I find it like I think that that I love Jitter that's a great piece yeah. of software but it's it is kind of jittery and it's a little it's not very efficient. Um, and but I found uh, Quartz Composer to be incredibly efficient, um, and I was able to do um, very high high power things pretty easily. That's wonderful. I'll have to check that out. <laughs> yeah, I was looking at uh, your video for Data Structures Monoliths Two earlier, yeah. and that is just amazing what you're doing with the video clips in that. Yeah, thanks. So what I'm doing in that is is um, and it's live, so it's not. It's I basically made a um, a video sampler, so you know you, th- you can think of like a sampler, eighty eight key keyboard, and you can put any audio sample underneath the um, underneath the, any key. So what I'm doing in that one is um, I'm putting any video sample underneath it, and um, a couple other things that happen in there is I can make loops, um, and, and what I do is if I press three keys down, three keys down, then it'll make a loop out of the three videos that I'm uh, pressing down by quickly changing between the, the, the videos that I have selected. Okay. And then I can record that loop into a data database wow. um, and, and be able to go back to it at any point in the performance. The, the kind of thing that I did that was un- unique in that piece also is um, rather than recording a, you know, if you're making an audio loop, you record audio, right? Um, instead of making an audio loops or video loops, I made it's data loops. So the loop is basically just a, an array of data. Okay. And so it, uh, when it goes to play the sample of Chewbacca uh, screaming, um, <laughs> it'll, when it goes to play it, it'll play from one spot to the next. And then when it goes to play it again, it'll start at where it ended. So, um, Interesting. so the Chewbacca video and this, in this, you know, we were just talking about object oriented programming and how powerful it is. This is something that just works in object oriented program that was, that was, um, really implied by the language I was using to write it. Cool. Now, how do you find, uh, on that subject, do you find that the language that you're using affects how you compose? I mean, I know that when I'm writing in super collider, it's different than what I'm writing in max. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, any tool that you use, um, changes how you make music. And, um, you know, I, I write some acoustic music in Super Collider. I'll, I might use it for algorithmic composition. Um, and I, I, I like to make this analogy. It's like, you know, if you listen to Beethoven's music, you hear the piano, right? <laughs> uh, if you listen to Messiaen's music, you hear the organ. Um, if you listen to my music, you hear the computer and it's, it's my instrument. And then, but then it's also like the little pieces of, the little different pieces of uh, software that you use change how you how you uh write write music mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> our producer dave's chiming in it's the same same as the difference between writing for violin and writing for clarinet which is different instruments different different strategies totally. yeah and if you don't take that into consideration then you just write music but you're not writing <laughs> music for the instruments that you're using exactly right. which which will have a huge effect on the performance i imagine <laughs> absolutely yeah so um it's it must be really interesting. So I understand that you're uh, you're a, a well established pedagogue as well, um, teaching different kinds of electric, electronic music composition, composition, uh, and uh, musicianship and things um, at Manhattan School of Music, Walden School, and Columbia University, and all over the place. And um, how how does uh, the different things that you do how do they enter into your education like do you do you end up doing a lot of coding or teaching like <laughs> dots and lines composition or uh yeah what <laughs> or do you right. do it all <laughs> yeah yeah i do all those things so 
um, at the Walden School, where um, where I, this is a summer camp for kids, and and we have an adult program too. In that program, I, I teach composition, so dots and lines composition, and um, and I also teach uh, electronic music there. And in that case, you know, I'm, te- teach, I'm teaching kids, so we're not going to do coding. Um, but you know, we have the class, the basic class that we teach is a music concrete class in electronic music. Cool. Um, and uh, and then after that, we have some some great um, improvising cl- improvising with electronics. Um, and just getting kids to to use electronics, not necessarily design and build them, because that's that would be beyond the scope of the program. Although I'd love to figure out how to do that at, at yeah. that at that yeah. school. Um, and then at Manhattan School, it's very similar, actually. I mean, I I, I teach a one year course in uh, electronic music, and the fall is music concrete, and the spring is uh, programming. And in the past, I've done. I've done Max. Um, I'm considering doing Super Collider this year just because I want. I, I, I think it could be. I think it. I think it could could work. Um, it, it is a much harder language to learn initially, but I think that the students are are up to it, and uh, and we'll see. We'll see how that goes. So you can yeah. ask me in six months. Um, <laughs> and uh, and then at Columbia, I I, um, I had been teaching. You know, if you're a grad student at Columbia, you teach this class called Music Humanities, which is the. It's really fun. It's basically the history of Western art music. Uh, yeah. For nine majors, it's great. You just like, you know, I love starting with Paratan because then when we get to the 20th century and people are like, "What well, music so weird?" I was like, "Yeah, well, Paratan was pretty weird too," you know. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, uh, <laughs> but then last last term, I taught a, a history of sound art class, which was um, which was really fun, and uh, and uh, basically looked at sound art through history and uh, and uh, or since 1950 basically and looked at the readings of it and uh, the d- dissected some major pieces. It was great. Um, is my refrigerator, do uh, you hear that? Let me yeah, hear it. Okay, give me one second. One second. <laughs> Ask me a question. <laughs> well, <laughs> is your refrigerator running? <laughs> 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 that was good. Okay. Oh, man. Um, getting back to uh, working with uh, kids, though, um, how do they interact with the electronics? I'm assuming that some of them are probably well versed in music, take lessons already, and some don't. And does that uh, come through? And does that create new and inventive ways of improvising electronically? Yeah, I mean, the wonderful thing about uh, teaching uh, young students is that they'll kind. Of, I mean. They don't have any. They have some some ideas of what music is to them. Um, I'm lucky to teach uh, at a place where it is a music camp. Yeah. So it, it is a composition camp essentially. So people have to come there with the idea like, oh, I want to compose music. Um, but they still they don't have any like preconceptions about what music should be. They they know they know some music and uh, they know that that. A lot, they know that a lot of the things I'm playing for them is are different than the things they've heard on the radio, but they're very open to that, and they're open to the idea that you know uh, exploring sound um, is is fun, and and I find that you know students surprise you. You think like the student like isn't, isn't into electronic music, and then they go into you know become tomorrow majors at Oberlin. You know, so um, it's. It's really uh, it's really great teaching that age because they they are so open to things and I find that you know at conservatory and at university that's a little harder although not that not that difficult mm-hmm. and with fresh young minds they might make some connections that wouldn't occur to some older students or something too you know I totally I mean there's I have a private student right now and and he's you know he's a piano whiz he's crazy he's crazy piano whiz but he heard that i was using super collider and he started fooling around with it and i'm just like he's just figuring it out it's yeah, crazy right. and <laughs> like you know if he gets good i don't know what i'm gonna do because <laughs> these crazy kids these days right? yeah that's that's gonna be your example when your students are like oh, i don't get it <laughs> yeah no totally it's like well i teach 13 year olds this and they get it so right exactly yeah <laughs> Got a thirteen-year-old who can do ambisonics, but uh, you're not willing to do sine waves. <laughs> yeah, come on. Right. 
So uh, you said that you were just coming off uh, uh, five days of rehearsal with Wedding, uh, Wed Ink Ensemble. Yeah. And uh, I, I see you also just came off of a CD release thing. What, what are you yes. working on with the ensemble now? Yeah, so um, we have a show in Switzerland in January, and, which is very exciting. Uh, the, the hard thing about running, you know, we started this ensemble when we all lived in New York. And now we don't. So uh, yeah. we have to rehearse when we can rehearse. And that was this last five days. So, um, But we have a gig in Switzerland in the uh, middle of January. And so we're, that's what we're preparing for. And the CD release was uh, Kate Soper's um, Voices from the Killing Jar uh, album, which is a 40-minute uh, monodrama opera, which is was we recorded and uh, and put out and are putting it out in January, but we recorded it last year and I mixed it. Cool. <laughs> yeah. I even sang the opera in that, in that I sing some Mozart aria. Oh, wonderful. A Mozart, <laughs> a Mozart aria. Dear Hala Rocha. No, uh, the Count's aria from, uh, the marriage of Figaro. Oh, okay. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Coder, pianist, vocalist. vocalist? Oh, well, actually, I mean, you know, in, in college I actually studied classical voice. Oh, and, wonderful. Uh, oh, that's, which was great. Yeah. Um, it's not you, like it's not the music I, I I love that music. It's just not what I want to do every day. So it do was, you ever, it's fun to do it for one one piece. Yeah. yeah. Do you ever give yourself a mic in in your performance and improvisation with groups and things? Or no. I mean, I think you know, contemporary vocal improv is one of the lowest of the lows. <laughs> so you know, there's 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 a few people that can do it really well. Yeah. Um, and then and then there's everyone else. Um, but <laughs> I, I do sing a mean uh, a mean Elvis, so I'll I'll do karaoke whenever. Nice, nice. Well, well, we'll, we'll look forward to get hopefully getting some uh, online documentation or something of this uh, this work you're doing in Switzerland. It's it's very, with oh, the, I thought you were going to say the very important karaoke work he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> that too. Yeah. Exactly. Right. So yeah, on that's yeah publicized through different means i'm sure <laughs> yeah anyway um well yeah thanks so much are, are there other projects that you have coming up uh yeah down, I, I down the line a, after that yeah i just did a um a, a seven um like seven city tour with uh peter evans uh, and we're putting out a we're going to put out a duo album uh sometime in the spring of of live um performances from that which I'm really excited about. I mean, I, I just finished mixing it and it's, I feel like we've, you know, we achieved something. It's, it's, I feel like it's really special. Cool. Um, and, um, yeah, I'm writing a piece for international contemporary ensemble. So a large, or it's a quintet with, um, with Jeff Snyder, who's, um, who made the Monta controller, but we have a duo called exclusive or, right. and, um, and, uh, he plays synthesizer and I play laptop and then we're playing with four brass players and percussion from ice. So that's, that's exciting. So that's for March. Sweet. And, uh, yeah, that's, those are the next two things coming up. Wonderful. Well, uh, yeah, thank, thanks so much for joining us. I think we're going to, uh, wrap up our episode with uh, a little bit of our, <laughs> our thing that we do at the end of every episode. It's our two minute challenge for the week. <laughs> So Wait, are you challenging me? Or oh, no, no, no. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> You're safe. I thought I, was, I thought I was like, wait, wait, don't tell me or something. <laughs> that would be great. We should do that. We could do that too, but... Uh... Well, thank you guys for having me. Having yeah. Me yeah. Really yeah. Great. Thanks right. so much. All right. Now on to the two-minute challenge. Uh, this time it is Nate's turn to tackle a topic in two minutes or less. Nate, what are you doing? <laughs> Well, this time I'm going to talk a little bit about audio delay. And uh, yeah, I guess it <laughs> looks like Dave's got the PD timer queued up and everything. There's no delay on the timer, unfortunately. That's right, exactly. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm ready when you are. All right. Go. <laughs> so audio delay it can be a problem or it can be a really interesting thing to use uh, musically. Um, you might have, <laughs> and I've, I've got a nice little sample already to explain this. I say you've got a sound going, patch in. You might also, ha like, say you wanted to mic me saying this, but you had a mic here and a mic here. You get just a little bit of delay, which can be a little bit of a problem. 
patch in. You see how it sounds just a little bit different? It's a little flangy is a term that people use, but it's phasing that you get. And this is a big problem um, when using, um, like, miking up a drum set or miking up an ensemble. You have to really be careful about where you place everything. So you might use audio delay to just delay one of those mics a little bit so that you get rid of that phasing problem. Um, <laughs> and it, it can become, like, patch in. Patch Get in. a little bit closer. Patch in. To the nice, strong, clean signal. It's a, it's a good thing when you <laughs> get rid of that phasing. Uh, this is also, uh, so that's in recording in regular acoustic performance. In a big space, you might have speakers at the front of the hall, but you also want to cover the people in the back of the hall. So you might have a bunch of different speakers around the room. You might, and uh, if those are all sending the same signal at the same time, you'd get phasing in the space. And so uh, you, what you would do is set up delay lines for each of the speakers so that uh, this speaker out front sends the signal, the speaker in back sends it just a little bit later so that they arrive in phase. And then I've only got 20 seconds left, so seconds. of course. <laughs> the other nice thing that you can do is like use it in performance or in uh, to make a spacey effect. Patch, patch, in, patch in. in. Adding, feeding the delay back into itself or you doing old tape delay where you change the speed. Patch, patch, patch in. Patch in. in. <laughs> I'm out of time to explain what that is. But anyway. Oh, that was, That's, I, that's I a little bit that, about audio delay. That... That might be that might be uh, an unsuccessful two minute challenge. I'm not sure you got to the end of audio delay. Yeah, it was a pretty big one. That was tough. Yeah. So, yeah, those are those are the some elements of audio delay in recording in uh, speakers in a space, and then also using it as a musical tool. Well, you know, Paul Lansky said that uh, all computer music is is basically manipulating audio delays. So. <laughs> <laughs> For you to sum that up in two minutes would be you having to sum up all of computer music in two minutes. So I think that's, uh, right. <laughs> I, think you, I think you did okay. Admirable. Well, thanks, Sam. <laughs> Valiant effort. <laughs> well, I think that about wraps it up for this month's uh, patch in episode. I uh, hope that you, thanks again, Sam, so much for uh, joining us on the show. Thank you. And uh, yeah, hope you, uh, we'll see you next year in 2014. Hope you all have wonderful holidays and this is, this is i'm nate blighton <laughs> i'm ben Furman, and that's it for this patch in